Today I want to share with you about how to hear God's voice. Uh, this is going to be one of the most practical things that I believe that I've ever taught. Actually, uh, this is a result of a teaching I did at our Colorado Bible College. And, uh, you know, it is hearing God's voice is a very important part of my life. It's a vital part of my life. Uh, you know, the scripture talks about in James chapter 1 that not the hearers of the word, but the doers are blessed. And I emphasize acting on the word and doing things. But actually, you can't do what you haven't heard first. It, it's Hearing isn't everything. You do have to follow through and be obedient and step out in faith. But hearing is the very first step. And in my life, having God speak to me and give me directions has made all of the difference in my life. I know that when the Lord first intervened and told me that he loved me, that just radically changed my life. And then very uh, soon he started directing my life away from the course I had planned, being a math major and becoming a teacher in school. And he just redirected all of that. And all of this came because I heard God's voice. And uh, God has spoken to me and given me revelation through the scriptures. I'm saying by my own personal testimony, that uh, hearing God's voice, I can't imagine how I could even survive as a Christian if I wasn't hearing God's voice and having God speak to me. When I come up against questions, and I mean not just the big things, but everyday decisions about, God, what do you want me to do now? You know, today I had a number of things I needed to do, and I prayed, and I really believe God spoke to me about that I needed to make this series on how to hear God's voice. There's many opportunities that I had to minister and do different things. I mean, on a daily basis, I hear God's voice and follow that. And so this is vital, I believe, for success as a Christian to be able to hear God's voice. So that's what this series is going to be about. And I just want to encourage you at the very outset uh, of this that you need to open up your heart and really anticipate God speaking some things to you through this and allowing you to be able to better tune your ear to hear what he has to say. This very first tape, I'm just going to be establishing some foundational things, talking about how that you already hear God's voice. You just don't recognize it. We're going to be talking about that. In our second tape, we're going to be talking about how God speaks to us and without me giving you that teaching, it's just going to be talking about how that the te God's voice doesn't come to our ears or to our brain. It comes to our spirit. And then your spirit relays that message. And because of that, it actually is coming from you. It's in the first person instead of the third person. And because of this, many people miss the voice of God. I'll be explaining that in the second tape. And then on the third tape, we're going to be talking about how important God's word is to hearing his voice. The vast majority of things that God has ever communicated with me actually came through his word. I personally believe that God isn't prone to speak to me outside of his word if the instruction I need is already in his word. Some people may disagree with that, but the way that I look at it, the way I believe God looks at it is, is why should he give you further instructions if you aren't already heeding the instructions he's given you in his word? Uh, you know, if you aren't esteeming one, what makes you think that you would esteem the other any greater? That's just not the way that God operates. You need to operate in God's word and in the instruction that comes through it as much as you possibly can. And that is the primary way of God speaking to us. And then anything he speaks to us beyond what the word says, any very specific direction he gives us, will always agree with the word. It will never contradict it. And therefore, you have to have a good understanding of the word of God to be able to judge whether what you are perceiving as God's voice to you is actually God, or if it's you, or if it's the devil. And you can't perceive that. You can't judge that properly without a proper knowledge of the word. So that's what we're going to be talking about. First of all, let me just make some statements here about how important it is to hear God's voice. I've already given my own personal testimony, but you know the scripture, there's just so many scriptures about the importance of this. But God wants you to hear his voice. When he created Adam and Eve in the garden, 
He spent time with them every single day, and they heard his voice in the cool of the garden. Now, he wasn't there to warn them, to chastise them, to cause them to repent. Many of the common ways that people today expect God to communicate with them, they were perfect, they were sinless, they didn't have needs, there were no problems to deal with, there was no direction that they needed. God spoke to them just solely for the purpose of fellowship. He loved them. And he wanted to communicate that love to them, and he wanted them to communicate their love back to him. One of the things that happens when you start hearing the voice of God, most people probably are looking for direction and answers, which those things are a part of it. But one of the great benefits of hearing the voice of God is just the ability to have God tell you that he loves you, that he appreciates you, just to have him as a friend. And this is something that many Christians uh, won't allow God to get that close to them because they have been taught through religious teaching about how holy God is, how unholy we are, and our religious preconceptions won't let God communicate in an intimate way to us. And that's a shame. Uh, That has to change. And uh, again, I say that God is speaking to us this way. We just don't perceive it. Because our religious training will not allow those kind of thoughts and feelings and perceptions to surface because we say, no, that's wrong. And so we put it down. You know, I've had the Lord speak things to me about how he loved me when he when I first had this uh, experience where God just poured his love out in my heart. uh, It was wonderful, but at the same time, it was confusing because of this doctrine that I had. And it took me a while to work through that doctrine and begin to see in the scriptures how I was forgiven and I was clean and how God could love me and be just and holy in telling me these things. But until I got some of that knowledge, I actually rejected thoughts and feelings and impressions about how God loved me. And that was God speaking to me. But I would reject those feelings and thoughts because I thought, no, that's that's carnal, that's selfish. I even blamed the devil uh, for, you know, trying to make me operate in pride, thinking that God loved me. But, you know, God does love me. And I've now renewed my mind, and now I hear God tell me things like that all of the time. I remember one service that I was at. This is probably 20-something years ago. One of the first times that it just ever really impacted me about how much God used me to speak to people. And I saw people just changing in front of my lives. I saw people that were set free and their life would never be the same again. I know because I've been in that situation where I've been in a meeting and I was impacted by God and I could recognize that same thing that was happening in other people's lives. And after that meeting, going back to my hotel, I was just praising God and thanking him for using me and, and allowing me the privilege of being involved in that process. And as I was thanking the Lord, I just had the Lord speak back to me, and he says, well, thank you, Andrew. And you know, when he said that, my old religious training again started to jump up like, no, that's not God, because God would never thank me for anything. You know, I'm a worm, and at very best, God would say, you sorry thing, you should have done better. But, you know, I've begun to renew my mind, and I had to admit, and finally I received. And since that time, I've had the Lord speak to me many times. When I'm thanking him, I've had him thank me. I've had God speak to me. This personal relationship is one of the great benefits of hearing the voice of God. And I could talk about that for hours. Let me also say that one of the great benefits of hearing the voice of God is the fact that you get knowledge through that. God will give you knowledge. He will impart his knowledge to you. How did you learn the carnal things that you know? Well, you learned it through people talking to you, speaking to you. You learned by people telling you things. You know, God wants to communicate with you and tell you his values, how he sees things. And I tell you, the benefit of this is just tremendous. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of scriptures that talk about the benefit of of knowledge, you know, that uh, my people perish for a lack of knowledge and other things. Here's a passage in Second Peter chapter 1, in verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you had the knowledge of God, which you can get by hearing God speak to you, then grace and peace 
would be multiplied unto you. If you have a lack of peace today, you've got a lack of knowledge, which means that you aren't hearing God's voice properly because God is wanting to speak to you. In verse 3, it goes on to say, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. It says here, everything that pertains unto uh, life and godliness comes through the knowledge of him. If you have a peace problem, you've got a knowledge problem. If you have an emotional problem, you've got a knowledge problem. If you have a sickness in your body, you've got a knowledge problem. It says all things that pertain unto life and godliness. If you have a uh, problem with anything in your life, you need the knowledge of God, which God will communicate to you. He wants to speak to us. Matter of fact, in John 14, 15, and 16, over and over it says that the Holy Spirit is sent to teach us all things, lead us into all truth, bring all things to our remembrance, John 14, 26, that he is sent to instruct us and remind us, bring back to our remembrance all of these things. There's just so much about how God wants to teach us his ways, but to do that you have to be able to hear his voice. And so for us to grow and mature and to take the character and the nature of God, you must be able to hear the voice of God. Again, we could talk about the benefit of that forever, but uh, I pray that you understand how important that is. Uh, also, when it comes to making decisions, to hear God's voice, uh, it's just in, it's, it's uh, something that you can't do without. I tell you, you need the voice of God, the direction of God in your decisions. You know, to me, it's comparable to a blind man. If, if you aren't hearing the voice of God, it would be comparable to a person who couldn't see trying to walk through a house that he's never seen before, that he's not acquainted with. You know, he would stumble over things, run into walls, uh, fall over furniture, hit desk and beds and all of these things. He'd fall down, get up, and then once he's hit something, he'd know, well, that's not the way to go. He'd move in a new direction, but again, he'd just wait until you run into something else and get up and fall and go again. You know, that is really a very good word picture of a person who is not hearing the voice of God. They are just going through life like a blind man stumbling. And when they make a mistake, when they fail in this marriage, then they say, well, that wasn't the way to do it. So they go get married again and try it and ruin that marriage and say, well, that also wasn't the thing to do. And, you know, after 15 or 20 marriages, maybe you get it figured out. There's a better way. There is a better way. And if we could hear the voice of God, which we can, then God could speak to you. For instance, over in... Um, Isaiah chapter 30. Let me see if I can find this passage of scripture. Uh, Isaiah was speaking to the Israelites and talking about how that because of their sin, God was going to send them into exile. He was talking about some of the judgment that would come upon them, etc. But in the midst of this, he uh, spoke about how that he would be gracious unto them in the latter end. And actually, this is talking about the day that you and I live in. As with so many passages of Scripture, when he prophesied something to Israel, a lot of that fulfillment is taking place in the body of Christ today. And so in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, he says, Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that, you may, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait on him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He, and he will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, this is talking about the previous judgment on the nation of Israel. Though he gave you the bread of adversity and water of affliction, Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Man, what a great promise. And this is talking about what's available to you and me today. The Lord said, You will hear a voice, saying, This is the way, walk thou in it. And this is what I'm trying to communicate. This is not the exception. It may be exceptional by people's experience, but it is what God intended to be normal. 
God intended it to be normal that all Christians hear the voice of God. They hear this voice behind them. And when they begin to start getting into strife with someone and they're going to ruin a relationship or cause problems in their marriage or, or cause grief and or lie about something and get caught in it later and you're going to be embarrassed and humiliated and it could cost you this. All of these things we begin to do. God's will is for you to hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk thou in it. That's not the way. Don't go that direction. You know, that is not abnormal. That is the way that God wants to speak to all of us. I'm praying that you will understand how important it is to hear God's voice. That's the first thing I'm trying to get across. One of the reasons that we don't hear the voice of God better is because we aren't absolutely committed to hearing it. We don't understand how important it is. We look around at other people who are surviving. They aren't doing well, but we get to where we use them as our standard of what's right and wrong, and we think, well, they're surviving. They don't really hear the voice of God, and so therefore we kind of fit into that same mold. We need to look at God's word and find out that he wants to speak a word saying, here's the way, walk thou in it. That's supposed to be normal. Every minute of every day, we're supposed to be in communion with God and having God give us wisdom and direction. That is not abnormal. That is normal Christianity. Praise God. Man, we could spend a lot more time on that. Let me use another verse of Scripture just to establish the importance of hearing God's voice. In John chapter 16, verse 13, it says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, this is another tremendous benefit of hearing the voice of God. He wants to show us things to come. He not only wants to communicate love to us and fellowship with us and tell us of our worth and of our value, those kind of things. He not only wants to help you in your day-to-day tasks, but he wants to show you things out in the future. Again, I could spend an hour just talking about the benefits of this. You know, what would it be like if you in your business knew what was going to happen. Say if you are a business owner and if you knew what the economy was going to be doing in the next year, how would that affect your business? And I'm not talking about you just guessed, but you knew what the economy was going to do. You knew whether there was going to be a surge and you needed to stockpile and get more uh, uh, product in, or if there was going to be a downturn and whether you needed to cut back and prepare for it. What would it be like if you knew what was going to happen with the stock market? What would it be like if you knew what was going to happen in relationships? What would it be like if you knew whether a person was going to live or whether they were going to die? Would you treat them differently? See, the benefit of just being able to see things to come, if you could stop and think about that, if you could perform in this on a regular basis, I guarantee you it would set you apart from the world. And the good news is, this is one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, according to John 16:13. And yet many Christians aren't taking advantage of this because they don't hear God's voice this way. Not because God isn't speaking, but because they don't receive. Many people aren't even re- expecting this. They aren't anticipating it. You know, in my own personal life, I have heard the Lord speak to me. I couldn't even tell you, but I'm sure it's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of times. I try and be in constant communication. And the Lord has not only spoken to me things personally about my relationship with him and things about moment-by-moment decisions, but the Lord has shown me things to come in the future. Now, he's done that many times. But one of the times that uh, really began to impact me in a specific way, I was studying this exact verse John 16, 13. And it just dawned on me that even though God had shown me things in the future, had given me goals and visions of what was going to come, that I hadn't begun to start receiving this the way that I should. And I just pressed in. I started seeking, desiring to hear the voice of God. And for a couple of weeks, I mean, I really focused on uh, just listening for God to show me things to come. Not just day-to-day situations, but things in the future. And after a couple of weeks of doing that, all of a sudden, I just knew something. I knew, and some of you will think this is a very small thing, but see, you have to start in small things 
and uh, then progress. You have to start in these, uh, you know, small things. The Lord said, if you aren't faithful in things that are small, he won't commit unto you greater things. And so the very first thing he showed me was that I was going to lose this pasture where I was keeping my horses. Now, that's not an earth-shaking thing, but I mean, all of a sudden, I just knew it. And this was really unusual because I had about three or four horses at this time. I can't remember what it was, but I was keeping them on a friend's pasture. He was a friend of mine from church. And this man, he offered these this pasture to me, and uh, every week at church, he would come up and thank me for having those horses there, saying, man, I don't have to mow anymore. They are eating all of the grass. He says it's wonderful. There was not any indication that he was displeased, displeased in the slightest way. And so when I felt like I was going to lose this pasture where I was keeping these horses, there was no reason to think that. It was contrary to everything I knew in my physical mind, and yet I just knew it. So I, I waited a while, prayed about it to make sure that was God, and I just stepped out in faith and said, Father, to the best of my ability, I believe that that's just something you told me. And so I said, what do I do with it? I said, I guess I need a new place. I certainly didn't want to go uh, pay somebody to board my horses, three or four hundred dollars per horse per month. You know, this was a low budget operation. I just let them eat the grass. That's all. I didn't feed them anything else. And so I prayed about it and said, God, you're going to have to give me another opportunity. Show me what to do. Well, within a couple of days, I was visiting with the man who his father had shooed some of my horses for me. And as he was asking about my horses, he says, you know, I've got a pasture that if you ever need a place to keep those horses, I'd be glad to have them in my pasture. I mean, this was consistent with what I felt God was telling me. So I talked to this guy. I agreed to move them on a Tuesday. On Sunday before that Tuesday, I went to church, and the man who was on the pasture where I was was presently keeping my horses, he just came up to me and he said, Andrew, I can't stand it anymore. Those horses have to be off my property by Tuesday. Now, again, there was, I, I didn't see it coming. There was not any indication of displeasure on his part, but yet the Lord had prepared me, and because of that, I just told him, I said, hey, it's not a problem. I'm moving them on Tuesday. They'll be gone the exact day this guy said. And you know what? That was a minor thing, but it was big to me because I knew God had shown me something to come. And because of that, even much greater than the fact that, you know, I I, I missed the inconvenience of having to go do all this stuff after the fact, that wasn't the real big thing. The thing that really impressed me was that I knew I'd heard God in a way that I hadn't really heard him before. And I began to start expecting things like that. Within a very short period of time, God told me about expanding the ministry. And we went from 12 radio stations to 90 radio stations over a period of five or six years. And you know what? That time of me hearing God's voice about the pasture for my horses was a part of that process. And then along with that, the Lord spoke to me about starting our Colorado Bible College which, of course, has blessed the people, the students, but it has been a tremendous blessing to me. I mean, that's a great thing that God has done in my life. And that uh, goes back to me expecting. God spoke to me things to come and showed me things that he wanted to do. The Lord spoke to me about expanding onto television, and that has more than doubled the size of our ministry and on and on. The Lord spoke to me one time about uh, not taking an airplane flight that I already had booked, already paid for the tickets. And yet, because I was able to hear the voice of the Lord, he showed me things to come. I didn't go on that airplane flight, and that plane crashed and killed 169 people. Every person on board died. God saved my life because he showed me things to come. On this series, I'm going to be describing exactly how God spoke to me, how you respond to that and stuff. But the very first point I'm trying to get across is just to show you how important it is. If you could just understand this one aspect of seeing things to come, man, it would radically change your life. It would make you stand out like a healed thumb in the midst of this perverted, corrupt world. If you could hear God show you things to come, man, that'd be powerful, powerful. So the first thing I'm trying to do is just to make you desire it. You know, the very first step in desiring I mean, in hearing the voice of God is to desire it. As long as you can live without hearing God's voice, you will. But when you get to a place to where God, I'm not content 
just, you know, learning things by trial and error. But God, I want to hear your voice. I know you're speaking. Help me to hear until you get a desire that is all consuming. I don't think you're going to effectively hear the voice of God. Not to say that God isn't speaking, but you won't be able to perceive it until you get to a place that you desire it more than anything else. Let me read a passage to you out of Jeremiah chapter 29. Verse 11 is a familiar passage of scripture. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. What I hear is a great key. This is talking about seeking the Lord, but you could apply this to seeking to hear his voice. It's in any area of seeking the Lord. It says, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. It didn't say part of your heart. It says all of your heart. One of the big reasons that people don't hear the voice of God better is because they they can live without it. They would like to hear the voice of God, but it's not a focus. It's not a priority in their life. It's just something that if it would happen, wonderful. But, you know, I'll give you five minutes, God, and if I can hear from you, fine. But if you don't speak in that amount of time, I'm out of here. I'm on my way. If that's your attitude, you are never going to effectively hear the voice of God. Now, I know that probably most of the people listening to this tape set on how to hear God's voice, this is not the kind of stuff you were wanting. You were wanting to, you know, well, give me step one, two, three. I do this. I say this word and here's it. Now, boom, it happens. But, you know, it's actually a matter of the heart. It's seeking God with all of your heart is a starting place. Like I said, if you can live without hearing God's voice, you will. This may not be what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. The very first step, I believe, is just getting so passionate that you say, God, I can't make it any longer. I have to hear your voice. I am not going to go through this life like a blind man bumping into walls. I am going to hear you speak. I am going to hear this voice behind me saying, this is the way. Walk thou in it, and I will obey it. When you get that attitude, when you seek with all of your heart, is when you begin to start really having a breakthrough in this area of having God speak to you. This is very important. I've had so many people come to me and say, well, I asked God to speak to me, and I didn't hear anything. Nothing worked. And so in a real sense, they get upset with God, and they're impugning God's character, saying, well, I asked. It wasn't me that wasn't listening. It was him that wasn't speaking. That's never the case. But you know what? God is not going to be just uh, like you You go your own way for weeks, months at a time. You don't seek God. You Your heart isn't stayed on God. But then your back gets against the wall. You need help. You go to God. You call out, oh, God, speak to me. Tell me what to do. And then he just shows up and tells you. And you take his wisdom. You get out of your problem. And then you go right back to your old carnal lifestyle. And you know th- what that would be doing is empowering you to live carnally. What that would be doing would be subsidizing you. God's not like that. God is not going to just bail you out. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. God loves you, and you don't have to be perfect for God to speak to you and for you to receive direction from God. But I am saying that there has to be this hard attitude that you're really desiring to follow God and seek him. It's not that you're wanting to do your own thing and when you get in trouble, you just come to God and ask him for help and he bails you out. That that would be empowering you. You know, I've had situations with my children where I love my children and I don't want to see my children get in any trouble. They're now grown. At the time I'm making this tape, they're 27 and 24. And they're grown and they're on their own and I don't want to see them make mistakes. But, you know, they come sometimes and ask me for my wisdom and for my help. And it's not that I'm not wanting to help them, but I I know that they aren't really wanting to just follow the Lord the way that they should. And until they do, if I just bail them out every time they get into trouble, it's going to do nothing but allow, allow them to persist in a lifestyle that isn't what God wants for them. And so I, I have to tell them, I love you, but you know what? You need to... You need to face some consequences. You've made these decisions 
This is the result of the kind of choices that you're making, and I just can't bail you out every time. Well, in a real sense, I believe that that's the way it is with God. We we do our own thing. If your heart isn't set on seeking God, then God is not going to just speak to you and bail you out every time you get into trouble so that you can go right back into a destructive lifestyle that isn't glorifying God, that is hurting you, causing you problems. You know, you need to you need to recognize that that's not the way. And this is what this verse is saying. You shall seek me and find me. It didn't say you shall seek me and find me, period. It says you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. You need to get to where you long to hear God's voice. So desire is the very first step in hearing God's voice. And that's the reason that I've said all of these things that I've said, trying to talk about how important it is to hear God's voice, is just to increase your priority on this and get you to where you really desire to hear God's voice. That is the very first step. Man, that's a powerful step. And if for some reason you aren't really desiring the things of God, then I would encourage you to stop right here and play this tape over again until some of these things sink down and it creates a desire on the inside of you. Until you have that desire, all of the other things I'm going to be teaching, I don't believe, will really impact you the way that they should. So that's the first step is desire. To me, the second step is to recognize that God is already speaking. It's not God who isn't speaking, but rather it's us who aren't hearing properly. In the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, where Jesus taught that parable about the sower sowing the seed, he said, these people's heart has waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing. In other words, what he was saying is it wasn't his speech that was the problem. It was the people's ability to hear that was the problem. And I really believe that that's true of all of us. Let me give you some scriptures on this. In John chapter 10, verse 1, he says, Verily I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, we're going to go on and read some other verses here, but let me just say that the Lord really isn't teaching about shepherding here. He's using this as an analogy, an allegory for the way he relates to his people. The sheep speak, that he's speaking of are believers, Christians, you and me. And the shepherd is Jesus. The sheepfold is the body of Christ. And the uh, master, the owner of the sheep, is God the Father. So he's making a comparison here. That's what he's talking about. In verse 3, he says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. This is talking about that the porter would be like an under-shepherd. It would be today like a pastor is supposed to be the porter, but, of course, Jesus is the chief shepherd of the sheep. And it says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know not the voice, for they know his voice. And a stranger... Will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. There are some radical statements made right here. The Lord said in verse 3, he says, the sheep hear his voice. It didn't say the sheep can hear his voice. The, key, the sheep may hear his voice, or it didn't even say that the sheep should hear his voice. It's just an emphatic statement that the sheep do hear the voice of the shepherd. This is talking about you and me, Christians, do hear Jesus speak to us. Now, most people struggle with this, and they say, no, that's not true. And the reason they say that is because of their experience. They say, man, I just don't have a clue what God's will is. I don't hear from God. God doesn't ever talk to me. Well, the very first thing you need to do here is to recognize that you would be wise to go by what God's word says rather than what you say. I'm not saying that you are insincere, but I'm saying that you may not recognize the voice of God, but God does speak to you. That's what this verse is saying. I'm not going to explain this because this is actually in the second tape in this series. But let me real quickly say that God speaks to you spirit to spirit not brain-to-brain or mouth-to-your-ear. 
you aren't going to hear God in an audible voice, although I believe he can do that. Some people hear the audible voice of God. I never have. And it's certainly not typical. That is not the normal way of God speaking to you. And God doesn't speak to your brain like in a third person. But rather, he speaks to your spirit, and it's just communicated in knowledge. It's not necessarily... Uh, it's just things that you perceive, intuition, knowledge. All of a sudden, you know things. Now, I'm going to explain that more in this second set, but let me just say those things to encourage you that, yes, God does speak to you. You may not have recognized it, but he does. So instead of thinking, well, no, God doesn't ever speak to me. I don't hear the voice of God. You need to go with what God's word says. His sheep do hear his voice. And it would be wise for us to, instead of saying, God, no, your word's wrong. That's not true. I don't believe that because I haven't ever heard your voice. Well, see, that's not pleasing to God to say his word isn't true and to operate in unbelief and just discount the word of God. What we need to do is say, God, I believe your word. Your sheep do hear your voice. God, I don't understand that. Help me to understand. Help me to hear. If I'm hearing your voice, well, then tune my ear so that it's clearer because I'm missing something here. Those kind of prayers are okay, but don't come against his word. We need to recognize that God is always speaking. Here's a, here's a comparison, an example that may help you understand this. But, you know, right now, wherever you are, there are television signals around you. It doesn't matter if you're in a car. There are television signals in that car. And you may say, well, no, there aren't. Why? Because you can't hear them or you can't see them. But, you know, that doesn't mean that they aren't there. They are there. You just can't perceive them with your little peanut brain. And I'm not saying that to criticize you. I just saying that about all of us. You know, we just can't perceive everything with our little limited brain here. But all you have to do is take a television set, plug it in, turn it on, tune it to a station, and all of a sudden, boom, there are those television signals, and you can see them and perceive them. But when you turn the set on, when you plugged it in, turned it on, and tuned it in, is not when the signal was originated. It was already being broadcast. But that's when you begin to perceive it. That's when you begin to receive it. That's why we call them a, a satellite receiver. The satellite doesn't, uh, the receiver doesn't generate the signal. It is just receiving that signal that is bounced off of a satellite. Your television and your radio are just receivers. They don't generate a signal. And so if you were to turn on your television set and if you didn't get a picture or if it was fuzzy or if it didn't work right, most of you wouldn't go and call up the television station and say, why aren't you transmitting? Instead, you would fiddle with your receiver, and you would begin to work with it, and you would actually take it in and get somebody to repair your television set. You wouldn't go to the station and criticize them and say, why aren't you transmitting better? I think everybody understands that. The stations broadcast all of the time. You only perceive it when you turn on your set. And if your set isn't getting clear reception or if it's not working, well, then you work with your set, not the station. But see, when it comes to Christianity, people have taken a different approach. We ask God to speak, and then if we don't hear something, if we don't perceive it, what we do is go back to God and gripe about his transmission and say, God, why aren't you talking to me? God, I asked you, speak. And then we start begging and pleading with God. We get someone else to agree with us that can manipulate and force God to speak. No, that's not. That's wrong. God is speaking constantly. His transmitter is never broken. God is broadcasting, transmitting to us 24 hours a day. It is never God who's not speaking to us. It's always our receiver that's the problem. Now, to me, that is an awesome illustration some of you may not understand the importance of that but see when it comes to hearing the voice of god instead of praying and saying god talk oh god speak and instead of looking as if god is the one who hasn't spoken this scripture is saying god does speak his sheep do hear his voice that voice is being heard by you but you just aren't perceiving it actually it's a problem of recognition is what it is. In our second tape, I'm going to really get into this in much more detail and when I talk about how God speaks to his spirit to spirit. But God is speaking to you. You just are having trouble perceiving it. 
How many of you have ever, and I'll explain this in the second tape in more detail, but how many of you have ever uh, made some decision that was wrong when the thing fell apart and you, in 2020 hindsight, you look at it and you know that, boy, I made the wrong decision. How many of you have ever done something like that and then said, I knew that was the wrong thing to do, and yet I did it anyway? How did you know it was the wrong thing to do? Well, it was just like an intuitive thing. You just had a knowing in your heart. And yet, for whatever reason, you allowed logic, circumstances, other people, something to pressure you into doing something against your better judgment. And after it's over, you say, I knew I shouldn't have done that. You know what that was? That was God that spoke to you. That was God giving you that wisdom. And yet you may have just perceived it as, well, no, I, I just felt something. Well, that's God speaking to you. Again, I'm going to explain that in more detail in our second lesson. But my point is, God is always speaking to you. So instead of despairing and and instead of trying to get God to fix his transmitter, instead of focusing your prayer on begging God to speak to you, you should focus your prayer in faith, saying, God, thank you that you are speaking to me because your word says so. And so uh, it's not you that's speaking that's the problem. It's my receiving that's the problem. God, teach me how to hear your voice better. Hopefully that's one of the reasons you got this tape set and you're going to receive these things that we're talking about. But this needs to be the attitude of instead of God, fix your transmitter. God, help me tune in my receiver. Going back to John 10, 3, it says, To him the porter openeth, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. You know what this is implying here is that this is personal. God not only speaks to us generally as the body of Christ. He not only speaks to nations and kingdoms, which there are scriptural examples of that. But you know what? God knows you by name. God wants to speak to you personally. Again, the privilege of this is just amazing. It's amazing that Almighty God wants to talk to me. You know, the scripture says, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. What an amazing, amazing statement that God Almighty wants to spend time with me. I mean, he's got important people, kings, princes, people who are movers and shakers, and yet God's always got time for me. He calls his sheep by name. Well, what a great privilege. We need to capitalize on this. We need to take advantage of it. And it says, He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Again, this is just saying that following God is dependent upon hearing his voice, knowing his voice, being able to recognize his voice above the, above the other voices that you hear. I tell you what, you have to be able to hear God's voice. And so one of the keys is that you need to uh, recognize he's speaking. And instead of pleading with God to fix his transmitter, you instead ask him to fix your receiver. So, so far I've talked about that, number one, you need to desire it. You have to seek with all of your heart. That's one of the steps. You have to know that God is already broadcasting. You don't need to beg and plead with God to fix his broadcasting, his transmitter. It's your receiver. Another thing is that we need to listen. Now, again, this is so simple that I know some people are wanting to go beyond this, but I think that this is critical. I'm just sharing with you out of my own heart things that have helped me to hear the voice of God. I had to reach a place to where I desired it more than anything, to where I couldn't live without it. And then I started having God speak to me. I started recognizing that God's always transmitting. It's not his problem. It's just my listening. And then I had to take some time, some down time to listen. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you that this is, I believe, one of the biggest blights in our day and time is that we are so busy that most of us don't have time to listen to God. Like over in 1 Kings chapter 19, when Elijah went to hear the voice of God, God, you know, there came by and there was a strong and mighty wind and it broke the rocks in two. There was a fire that was so intense it melted rocks. There was an earthquake so intense that it split the rocks in two. But God wasn't in any of these spectacular, dramatic ways. 
And finally, there was a still, small voice. (laughs) This is amazing. But you know, this is consistent with God. God delights in doing things in such an understated way that it just awes people. It overwhelms them. You know, Jesus, when he came to this earth, he didn't come in pomp and circumstance. He could have arrived on the space shuttle and, of course, even greater technology than that. He could have had his angels appear to kings and announce his birth to them, but instead they talked to shepherds and all of this. God delights in doing things in a way that is so natural, so common, that actually it takes faith to perceive that it's God. The scripture says in Isaiah chapter 52 that when we see Jesus, there isn't any beauty in him that we should desire him. There's no comeliness, no beauty. There's nothing to be desired. In other words, Jesus didn't have a halo around him the way that people picture him. Jesus wasn't spectacular. Jesus was natural, and yet he was supernatural. God delights in doing things in a way that it takes faith to perceive it because Hebrews 11:6 says without faith it's impossible to please God. God delights in doing things in an understated, simple, subtle way. That is the nature of God and it's consistent all throughout scripture. Now there are times that he's manifested himself in dramatic ways more than enough to prove to us he's all powerful and that he has these things, but on a whole God delights in doing things in a way that it takes faith. And that's the way it is with hearing the voice of God. God is not going to speak to you in a booming voice primarily. It's possible, but I've never heard it. I've never heard an audible voice. God could make every dog that walks by talk to me and tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do that day. He could make a bird come sit on my shoulder and whisper in my ear and tell me exactly where to turn and what to do. He could have every cloud that comes over, you know, imprinted with something that only I see that tells me exactly what to do. He could have a tree talk to me. I mean, he could have a tree point and tell me what direction I need to go when I'm lost. God could do anything, but that is not the way that God is going to speak to you. The way he's going to speak to you is in this still, small voice. And it is going to be so slight that, you know what, unless you are desiring it and believing that he's already speaking and listening, you're going to miss it. I think that a lot of people are missing God speak to them because they aren't still. The scripture says in Psalms chapter 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. The scripture there is saying very clearly that, you know, you need to slow down. You need to have some downtime to where you just listen. I could give so many examples in the Word of God, all the way back to uh, Isaac. He used to go out into the field at the evening tide to meditate. Every day. What was he doing? He was listening. You could you could say a lot of things. He was, you know, quiet and focused on God, maybe praying, doing all kinds of things, but it was listening. The scripture talks about the benefit of meditating. It talks about Abraham in the cool of the evening sitting there and seeing these angels come. And you know what? He was just sitting. We have gotten to where we are so busy. If you ask the average person, how are you doing? Their response will be something about how busy they are. I know that I oftentimes say something like, man, I'm busier than a one-armed paper hanger. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just making a joke, but it's true. I am so busy, I could use two or three of me. That's not good. We've got all of these modern conveniences to give us extra time, and then what do we do with our extra time? We think, well, man, I could get more done, and we fill it with something else. And we are just busy, busy, busy. And I don't know how to say this in a profound way. I mean, it's so simple. Most people just pass over this and don't pay attention to it. But I'm telling you that if you are a busy person that never has any time to sit down and just listen. And I'm not talking about some people will say, well, yeah, I I don't have much time, but I've got quality time. No, you need some quantity time, too. You need some time. It takes effort to empty yourself of all of your concerns. If you are, you know, going 90 miles an hour and then you stop for five minutes and you're going to have five minutes of quality time, I can promise you that your mind and heart doesn't slow down, empty yourself of all of the things, your schedule in those five minutes, and then you rev back up and take off and go 90 miles an hour again. That that just isn't going to work. It won't work to say I have quality time. There needs to be some quantity time. 
I can't say what that is. It's going to vary. There was a time in my life before I got married, and uh, actually there was a period of time when I was in Vietnam that, you know, I wasn't working, I wasn't doing anything, and I was able to spend 16 hours a day studying the Word. Boy, that fine-tuned me. That did wonders. I mean, miraculous things for me hearing God speak to me. But now I can't spend 16 hours a day. If I was to spend 16 hours a day studying the Word every day and just praying and listening, you know what? I'd be irresponsible. God has given me responsibilities, and that won't work. If you are a mother of four or five children and you're going to spend the day fasting and praying and you aren't going to change their diapers and feed them and watch them, that's irresponsible. You know what? You can't do things like that. But anybody, I don't care who you are, can devise some time. And you're going to have to pray and just let God lead you. I know that when our children were little, my wife always stayed home and took care of our kids. And uh, when our kids were little, they took a lot of time. And But even at that, Jamie had them take a nap every day which was good for them. And during that time of their nap, instead of her working and doing something, she just disciplined herself that she was going to spend that hour or hour and a half, whatever it was, just being quiet, praying, reading the Word, and listening. Even a mother of two children can find time every day, sometime, 30 minutes or something. You can do it. It can be done. I can't describe or prescribe exactly how much time that is, but I'm saying this principle is here that we have to listen. Again, I refer back to John chapter 14, 15, and 16. If you get time, you need to go and read those verses and talk that talk about how the Holy Spirit is sent to teach us all things, to lead us in truth, to bring to our remembrance what Jesus has said, to glorify Jesus, to show us things to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. But you know what? You've got to show up for class. You've got to actually spend some time to where you are focused on God. And I mean focused entirely on God. To where you can rid your mind and your heart of all of the things that are occupying you normally. And you just get to where you are listening. In my own personal life, I try and do that on a daily basis. I usually get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and spend from 5 till 6.30 or something studying and praying. It doesn't always work out that way, but that is a normal routine. But, you know, even at that, there are times that I get so busy doing something that it occupies me even during that time early in the morning. And so there are some times that I will literally just take a day off or two days off And I live in a place that is great. I mean, I can't see a neighbor. I'm looking out my windows. I can't see anything but mountains and sky and trees. And I can go out and walk on my property and pray and do things. And so anyway, I'm blessed in that sense. And I'll usually just spend a day at home or two days at home and turn off the uh, telephone and just pray and seek God. And you know what it does? It helps me to listen. It gets me back to where my heart's just stayed on God. Sometimes I've had to go and go somewhere and spend a day or two away someplace to just get away from everything. But whatever you have to do, you have to get into a position to where you are listening. I'm convinced that one of the reasons we don't hear or perceive the voice of God more is because we are just too busy. We aren't listening. You know, there is a very simple passage of Scripture In Acts chapter 9, and this is so simple, most people miss this, but one day I was reading and God just, I mean, impacted me in a miraculous way through this verse of Scripture. Uh, In Acts chapter 9, it says um, that the Lord appeared unto Ananias. This is Acts chapter 9, verse 10. It says, There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And, of course, the story goes on that God told him to go minister to Saul and uh, that he would be have his blindness removed. He would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he prophesied over him that he would be an apostle to the Gentiles. It was awesome what God used Ananias to do. But the Lord just spoke to me through this 10th verse where he said in a vision, Ananias, and Ananias answered, Behold, I am here, Lord. 
And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Andrew, how many times have I called your name and you weren't there? I was calling out, but you were so busy. You were doing something else. You were gone. You weren't in the place where you were supposed to be. And you weren't there. Ananias was there. You know, it's possible that Ananias was not the leading Christian in Damascus. It's possible that he was not the greatest saint. But one of the reasons God used him is because he was there when God called his name. It's possible. The scripture doesn't say this, but I know it's true. I've heard many people say that they weren't God's first, second, third, fourth choice. They were way on down the list. It's possible that Ananias wasn't the first one that God spoke to. Maybe he had spoken to other Christians about going and ministering to Saul. And yet they were so busy, they didn't hear. Man, this is an awesome statement for Ananias to say, Behold, I am here, Lord. You know what? I would love to walk with the Lord to such a degree that I was always there. Man, I don't want to be, you know, not all there. I want to be there. I want to be listening. I want to be hearing the voice of God. And I believe that this is essential. So as we start this series talking about how to hear the voice of God, I've tried to inst- stress the importance of it, how, how beneficial it is to hear the voice of God. I've talked about how but you have to desire it with all of your heart. I've talked about how that God is always speaking. We don't need to direct our energies into trying to get him to talk. We need to put our efforts into us hearing. And then we need to take some downtime and just go to listening hearing the voice of God. We need to be like Ananias and say, Behold, I am here, Lord. You know, I'm not perfect in that realm, but I'm not condemned either. I haven't arrived, but I've left. And praise God, I believe the same thing can happen for you. You don't have to be perfect. It would be wonderful if all of us could spend every day, all day, every day seeking the Lord. But you know, that's not God's will for any of us. He doesn't want us living in a monastery Forgive me if that rubs somebody's concepts the wrong way, but God wants us. You know, we're the salt of the earth. we got to get out of the salt shaker. We need to be out there touching people's lives. But even at that, you can do it in such a way where you are keeping your mind stayed on the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That scripture says you can bring every thought into captivity and under obedience to Christ. You can go through your job and you can think and meditate on God all day long. I know some of you aren't understanding this, you aren't relating to it, but you know, you can go through your job and worry all day long. If you had a fight with your wife or with your husband, you can go do your job and still never really have that out of your mind. If you have a financial problem, you can go to work and still be thinking constantly about, oh God, what do I do to solve this? If you can worry all day and still function and get your job done, well, then you can also meditate on God all day. The same part of you that worries is the same part of you that meditates. You can develop a habit to where you are constantly in tune and listening to God. I think it's going to have to start with you spending some downtime, quantity, downtime, shutting off your worries and fears and the things that occupy you so much, turning off the television or something else, and just, I mean, quantity, time, focused on God, tuning your heart in, and then you can go back into the world and maintain that same attitude. And every once in a while, you may have to take some time off and readjust. But you put a priority on it like this. Even if it's only 15, 30 minutes a day, start with that. And you will see such benefit that I believe it will encourage you and inspire you to start spending more time focused on the things of God. And as you continue to do this, if you just do the things that I've talked about on this very first tape, just get to where you desire it more than anything else. Know that God is already speaking. It's not his transmitter that's the problem. It's your receiver. And then just spend some time listening. I mean some quantity time. Be still and know that he is God. Open up your heart 
and and desire and just let God speak to you. If you would do those things, if you never finish the rest of this series and learn nothing else that I'm going to say about how to hear God's voice, I could guarantee you doing those things would make a radical difference in the way that you perceive God speaking to you. Your life would begin to change. And praise God, I just believe that it's going to happen. I believe that God has spoken to you through this, and I believe that this is going to be the beginning of a brand new relationship to where you hear the voice of God clearer than ever before.